When Justice Antonin Scalia died unexpectedly in February of this year, the Supreme Court became a part of the political dialogue in a way not seen in a long time. His death created vacancy on the Supreme Court in a presidential election year. Until the death of Justice Scalia, there had not been a Supreme Court vacancy in a presidential election year since 1988. Perhaps it is not surprising, then, that the current vacancy in this election year has put new focus on the Supreme Court. But why? We do not vote for Supreme Court justices, but citizens do vote for presidents who make the nominations and senators who approve or reject them, all as provided in the Constitution. President Obama has nominated Merrick Garland to succeed Justice Scalia. But unless the Supreme Court confirms the nomination this year, it will fall to the president and senators who hold office next year to fill that vacancy. These decisions by people we do elect have serious and long-term consequences. When a president appoints a justice with the advice and consent of the Senate, that justice will serve until he or she dies or retires. One justice, William Douglas, served more than 36 years. Because of lifetime tenure, the justice who ultimately succeeds Mr. Scalia will be called upon to decide hundreds of cases. Many of those cases will have significant consequences for our nation and its citizens, consequences that will last well beyond our lives and the lives of the justices who make those decisions. We are fortunate indeed to have with us a speaker who has the background and experience to help us understand the makeup and workings of the Supreme Court. John Rappaport grew up in the Detroit area. He was an undergraduate math major at Stanford University. From there, he went to Harvard Law School, and he is a magna cum laude graduate of that school. He clerked for two judges in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And then he had the experience that makes him particularly qualified to address this question. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He also has worked in the federal habeas unit of the Los Angeles Public Defender's Office and was a litigator in a private law firm. Now, he is on the faculty at the University of Chicago Law School. His specialties there include criminal law and procedure, federal jurisdiction, evidence, and constitutional law. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, John Rappaport. I think I will make this whole thing fall apart. Uh, so, uh, forgive me for sort of staying planted. Um, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, cover the territory uh, that we've agreed to. So uh, the topic uh, that we agreed on was uh, our Supreme Court, who they are, how they got there, what they do, and why it matters. And uh, as I sat down to prepare my remarks tonight, I decided it would be best to rearrange the order a little bit. Uh, because I think that you'll have the best appreciation uh, for uh, learning about who they are and how they got there if you first know uh, what they do and why it matters. So I'm going to first talk about uh, what the court is, what it does, uh, where it gets its authority, uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, sort of why it should matter to you as voters. Uh, then I'll t start talking about the individual justices, who they are, how they got there. Uh, and then the last is uh, my invention, which is uh, why who they are matters. And I think that's obviously relevant to uh, the, the Scalia vacancy and the Merrick Garland nomination in the upcoming election. You know, the court, I think, uh, every American knows that the Supreme Court is important, uh, but it's a very mysterious institution. Uh, uh, as we discuss every year, there are no cameras allowed in the courtroom. About once a year, there's a big push to get 
uh, cameras in the Supreme Court courtroom, but it's never succeeded. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it never does. So no one gets to watch the court uh, do its job. Uh, and, you know, its basic function is pretty esoteric, right? It's something that lawyers can understand a little bit, uh, and non-lawyers have a lot of trouble picking up a Supreme Court opinion and understanding what the court is talking about and how it arrives uh, at these really momentous decisions. Uh, one thing I'm curious about before I go on, how many lawyers are in the room right now? Okay, just a handful. All right, good. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, the other thing that's interesting is the justices, uh, again, despite their importance, they're really not public figures. Uh, so, uh, in 2012, uh, legal research company FineLaw.com uh, did a big national survey and found that two-thirds of Americans couldn't name uh, any Supreme Court justices. Uh, I'm curious, how many in here think that they could name all of the Supreme Court justices? Okay. How many think they could name at least half? All right, that's pretty good. So, uh, you know, back when Fine Law did its survey, uh, uh, the highest hit rate they got was for uh, the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, 20% of Americans uh, could come up with Roberts' name. Uh, and the lowest uh, was Justice Breyer, uh, whom only 3% uh, of the surveyed Americans could name. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not something that most average Americans know a lot about, and that's why it's good uh, for me to be here tonight. Okay, so let's start by talking about what they do. Um, I thought it would be interesting on several of these questions to go back to the constitutional text. Uh, this is where the Supreme Court comes from. Uh, this is why we have a Supreme Court. So the, the Constitution, uh, in Article 3, Section 1, uh, says just this. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may ordain and establish. So if you're not used to reading legalese, I'll, I'll help you break it down a little bit. Uh, the judicial power of the United States, uh, it actually turns out not to be defined anywhere in the Constitution. There was an assumption by the people who drafted the Constitution that, that we knew what the judicial power of the United States was, although that turns out to be often the subject of great debate. Uh, it says it shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and such other inferior courts as Congress may establish. One thing this means is that the Supreme Court is the only court that's actually created by the Constitution. And all other federal courts are created by Congress. And if Congress wanted tomorrow, it could abolish all of the other federal courts in the country, except for the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court is created uh, by the Constitution <coughs> itself. Now, what is the court supposed to do? Well, we're told that the judicial power shall extend uh, and I've left out some language here wherever there's an ellipsis, uh, to all cases arising under this Constitution and the laws of the United States. So what does this mean? Well, the most important words here are cases arising under this Constitution. That means cases involving constitutional law. So this is saying that one of the jobs of the Supreme Court is to decide cases involving constitutional law and the laws of the United States, which means federal statutes and federal regulations and so on. The lawyers in the room will know at certain points that I'm simplifying certain things. But the basic idea here is that the, the job of the US Supreme Court is to decide cases that arise under constitutional law, federal constitutional law, or involve questions about federal statutes. Marbury versus Madison was an early Supreme Court decision written by uh, John Marshall, who's the most famous Chief Justice uh, in the existence of the court. And this was an era back, you know, in the early 1800s when uh, the court was kind of still working out its role. It wasn't clear to everyone uh, what role the court was going to play in American society. And Chief Justice Marshall writes, it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. And what that means is that the, the Judicial Department and the Supreme Court, which sits atop the Judicial Department, is the final interpreter of federal law, meaning the Constitution and federal statutes. So the Supreme Court doesn't make federal law. Congress passes statutes. The legislature passes statutes. 
But the Supreme Court is the final interpreter of what those statutes mean. So to use a, a common uh, law school example, if Congress passes a statute that says uh, no vehicles in the park, and there's a question now about whether a bicycle is a vehicle. Is a bicycle a vehicle or not? You could see arguments in both directions. And it would be the US Supreme Court that would get to have the final say on whether a bicycle qualified as a vehicle or not. Or to use an example you know, closer to home, uh, if uh, Michigan passes a law, let's say the ban on affirmative action, and someone challenges it and says this violates the federal constitution, the US Supreme Court would have the final say on what the federal constitution means insofar as that affects the validity of the Michigan law. So we say, in legalese, we say that the court has the power of judicial <coughs> review. It has the power to declare laws as well as executive acts, like something the president does or something the governor does, and judicial acts, like a criminal <coughs> conviction, it can declare those to be unconstitutional and thus invalid. And it has the final say on that. If the court uh, construes the Constitution in a way that we don't like, the only recourse is to amend the Constitution, uh, which is incredibly difficult and has not happened very many times in our history. So it has a lot of power. Now, part of the reason that it has so much power, and part of the reason that it has this power of judicial review that I mentioned, uh, comes from this part of the Constitution. This is Article 6 of the Constitution, and it says that the Constitution and the laws of the United States, again, meaning federal laws, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state, like Michigan or Illinois, shall be bound thereby, bound by the federal constitution, bound by federal statutes. Anything in the constitution or the laws of the state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Basically what this means is federal law trumps state law when the two conflict. Okay, this is written into the US constitution. Now one thing that's important to understand about the court, and I think gets uh, misrepresented sometimes in the press, is that the court is a passive institution. It's a court and it has to wait for issues to come to it. The court cannot just decide to reach out and decide whether the uh, Michigan ban on affirmative action is invalid or not, unless someone files a lawsuit and that lawsuit gets litigated all the way up to the US Supreme Court. Uh, the court has to sit and wait for issues to come to it. Right? The court can only decide what are called cases and controversies. Uh, or, or, as we sometimes put it, the court cannot write advisory opinions. The court cannot just sit there and say, hey, we noticed, Michigan, that you passed this law recently, and we think it's unconstitutional, and we're going to write a decision to tell you that. You can't do that. <coughs> the only way it's going to pass on, express an opinion on, the constitutionality of something Michigan does is if there's litigation that rises all the way uh, up to the US Supreme Court. Now, I keep mentioning cases rising up to the Supreme Court. This part of the Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, talks about what cases the court will hear. Now, the first sentence is not really the important one, but it basically says that certain special kinds of cases, ambassadors, things like this, in those cases, the court shall have original jurisdiction, which means you can actually file your lawsuit in the Supreme Court itself. But those are the exceptional cases. Most cases reach the Supreme Court through appellate jurisdiction, okay? So let me show you, this is a diagram of uh, our judicial system. And what you see on the left side is the federal court system. So in the bottom left, you see US federal district courts. These are the federal trial courts where you would file a federal lawsuit. I think that'll go away in a second. Uh, there we go. Uh, above that are the federal courts of appeals. There are 13 of them. If you lose in the district court, 
uh, you lose at trial, you can appeal up to the Federal Court of Appeals. And if you lose there, then you could appeal up to the US Supreme Court. What you see in the middle is essentially the state court systems. So like the, the court system of Michigan or Illinois or any other state is represented in that middle column. You have your local trial courts, which are often uh, county to county. Each county will have its, its own court system. You'll have state appellate courts, the Michigan Court of Appeals. And then you'll have the highest state court of appeals, which here is the Michigan Supreme Court. But if you litigate all the way up through the Michigan courts and you lose in the Michigan Supreme Court, you could then file an appeal to the US Supreme Court and hope to get your case heard uh, by the Supreme Court that way. The rightmost column is some specialty courts that we really don't need to spend as much time on, uh, but they are uh, courts involving special federal issues, uh, and appeals from those courts also go up to the US Supreme Court. Now, you might be asking yourself, you know, why would we want an institution with this much power? Why do we all, all, you know, 300 million of us Americans, why do we defer to this court, right? What's so great about them? Uh, there's this great quote, uh, from a very famous justice, Robert Jackson. He says, we're not final because we're infallible, but we're infallible only because we are final. What this means is, we don't get the final say because we're so special and we never make mistakes. That's not the idea. We never make mistakes because we get the final say. <laughs> Meaning, whatever we say just is the right answer because someone has to be charged with giving the, the final answer, right? The buck has to stop somewhere. And in our system, the buck stops with the Supreme Court. That doesn't mean that the court is perfect. That doesn't mean that, that you can't read a, a decision by the court and think it's wrong. But it does mean that by virtue of the fact that this is what the court said, it's right, right? Because it is the final say. And if you want to overturn it, you'll have to pass a constitutional amendment. This is a map showing the uh, federal appellate circuits, okay? Our federal judiciary is divided uh, into 13 circuits. You actually only see 11 numbered on this map. There are two tiny circuits just in the District of Columbia, uh, and there are 11 regional circuits. And uh, appeals from federal trial courts will go up to the Federal Court of Appeals for that geographic area. Uh, so Michigan is in the Sixth Circuit, along with Ohio, <coughs> Kentucky, and Tennessee. Uh, my current home state, Illinois, is actually in a different circuit. It's in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, and as Marilyn mentioned in introducing me, uh, I clerked for some judges. I sort of apprenticed for judges out in the Ninth Circuit in California uh, before I moved out here uh, and, and became uh, a law professor. Uh, and the main job from day to day, what makes up the bulk of the US Supreme Court's work, is resolving disagreements among these many circuits. So if you think about uh, my no vehicles in the park example again, it may well be that when people riding bicycles all over the country start filing lawsuits and arguing, you know, I should be allowed to ride my bicycle in the park because a bicycle is not a vehicle. It may be that different circuits reach different answers, right? The Sixth Circuit might do its best and in good faith decide the case and decide, you know, a bicycle, it is a vehicle, so you can't take it into a park. The Seventh Circuit might decide, no, we've studied the case and we think a bicycle is not a vehicle, so you can take it into the park. And you get these differences uh, of opinion, what we call circuit splits, around the country. And the U.S. Supreme Court looks for those cases, and, and those make up the bulk of the cases that the court will decide. It's when there's a disagreement among the circuits, the court will take it to give one final answer so that there's a uniform answer for the whole country. Now, how do they get the cases? Well, if you want the U.S. Supreme Court to hear your case, you file what's called a petition for certiorari. You can think of it like an appeal. You file an appeal, you ask the court to take your case. The court gets about 7,000 uh, of these petitions per year. The justices only hear about 80 cases a year. Uh, and they decide another 50 or so in, in a sort of uh, summary fashion. 
But in terms of a, getting full review of your case, your odds are about 1%, give or take, from year to year of having the court take your case. Now, a couple decades ago, the court was hearing a lot more cases each year, almost twice as many. Uh, there are a lot of competing theories out there you know, about why the caseload has dropped. Uh, some involve the justices being lazy and liking golf. Others involve um, them spending more time on each opinion. The opinions seem to be getting longer, which may or may not be a good thing. Uh, but these are, these are the statistics. Now, how does the decision-making process work? I think this is important uh, to talk about because I think if you read a newspaper article about a decision that just came out or about an argument that the court heard, you might think that the court is just looking at this case for the first time. And when you read something a justice said, you might want to interpret it like a sort of knee-jerk reaction to a case. But it's not at all that way. The first step in the process is the court has to grant cert, we would say. Grant the petition of cert for certiorari, meaning decide to accept the case, <coughs> accept the appeal. And it takes four votes, <coughs> the votes of four justices, to grant cert in a case and decide to hear it. When the court grants cert in a case, it will then be scheduled for oral argument about three to six months later. And in that three to six month period, the courts and their law clerks, uh, with their assistants, uh, will be reviewing the case very, very carefully. The parties will file extensive briefs. They will file the record, which is basically the facts in the case. And by the time the justices get to oral argument, you know, when the lawyers actually come to court and talk about the case, they have been studying the case for months. And they have been talking to uh, their law clerks extensively. And their law clerks have been preparing memos. And they've been going back a second time, a third time, and preparing on these cases before the lawyers ever come to court and, and actually argue the cases. Oral argument will usually be about an hour a case, and the justices will uh, pepper the lawyers with questions. It's a very uh, sort of lively, somewhat combative uh, atmosphere most of the time. And immediately after the arguments, the justices will go to conference. Uh, and what this means, basically, is they, they actually go to a conference room, uh, this is a picture of the, of the actual conference room in the U.S. Supreme Court. You see there's nine chairs there. The justices are the only ones in the room. There are no law clerks, no secretaries, no assistants, no gophers, just the nine justices. And this is where they actually vote on the cases. They vote immediately after oral argument. So they take the vote, and because there are nine justices on the court, usually, right now we have eight, but usually there are nine justices on the court, it takes five votes to reverse, meaning it takes five votes to overturn what the court below did. Okay? And so they'll vote at this conference and they'll figure out uh, you know, which side has a majority of the nine votes. And then, uh, that says opinions, uh, the Chief Justice will uh, assign the opinion to one of the justices in the majority. And the justice will draft, working with his or her law clerks, uh, draft an opinion and circulate it. And then there will be this prolonged process of revision where uh, people, other justices will either uh, give criticism of the opinion and, and suggest changes, uh, or they will say, you know what, I just really disagree with this opinion. I'm going to write a separate opinion, either a separate concurrence or a dissent, meaning a, a disagreement. Uh, and this will often go on for months. The opinions will be in draft form, many, many drafts. Uh, circulating within the court uh, before the public ever sees anything. Now when the opinions and all the revisions are done, uh, the court will make an announcement. And there's actually a day uh, when the justices come to court and they, they announce the outcomes uh, from the bench. And someone, uh, uh, usually the author of the opinion, will read part of the opinion. Uh, and then it gets published uh, in in a, in, you know, it used to get published in this book called The U.S. Reporter. Today, what really matters is it goes up online immediately after the announcement. Uh, and people all around the country uh, can view the opinion, uh, and they'll start seeing news stories about it immediately. Uh, and law professors and lawyers will read these opinions. And that's the basic lifeline of a U.S. Supreme Court case from start to finish. It's a very long process, and, and the justices are not deciding these things on a whim or, or based on their major reactions. 
So that's what they do. Now, let's talk about why it matters. Uh, you probably saw a, a diagram like this back in like, high school civics class. Uh, this is the separation of powers in our federal government, right? And the judiciary is just one of the three branches. And our whole system of government is designed to have three co-equal branches that check each other, okay? And, you know, the basic idea, uh, a little bit oversimplified, is that the judiciary is there to keep a check on the legislature and the executive. Uh, if the judiciary were not there, then the legislature and the executive could, could run away with their power and do whatever they want. And they could start passing all sorts of laws uh, that a lot of us wouldn't like. And that would impinge uh, on individual rights. And so the court is there uh, to push back on that. Uh, lawyers often say that the court is a counter-majoritarian institution. So what this means is you know, the court's job is to push back on things that the majority does. And you can look at this two ways, right? So, so the favorable way to look at it is you can say, well, the court is there to protect disfavored persons or disfavored interests against what's sometimes called the tyranny of the majority, right? So, uh, you know, uh, the, the, let's say the Democrats uh, win uh, the, the, the presidency, the Democrats win the legislature, and they pass a law that says, uh, uh, all Republicans have to give up their homes to Democrats, right? <laughs> you know, you might not like this. At, at this point in history, uh, Republicans are disfavored interests, disfavored persons, and the court is there to protect disfavored interests and persons. Historically, this has often been uh, members of disfavored racial groups or religious minorities, uh, women. Uh, so this is, you know, the positive spin on what it means to be counter-majoritarian. Uh, but you can also look at it and say, yeah, but I think the court is bad because the court is getting in the way. The court is thwarting democratically validated laws and policy choices, right? Uh, uh, we, uh, the, the public of Michigan, we voted for this ban on affirmative action. Why should this court, made up of these nine people in Washington, D.C., get to overturn what we did? That's what it means to be counter-majoritarian. We don't actually live in a majoritarian society. We live in a democratic society. And democracy means something a little bit more complicated than majoritarian rule. Okay? So this is, the, this is the role of the court, and this is why it matters. It either matters because it protects your individual rights, or it should matter to you because it stands in the way, potentially, of things that you and a majority of the people want to do. Now, you probably know this. Uh, but we're a very law-bound and very litigious society, and this means that the court ends up deciding many, many issues of great practical importance to our everyday lives. And when it decides these issues, it tends to stick with those decisions for a long time. There's this legal concept called precedent, or the Latin is stare decisis, and what it means is that when the court decides something, it's not going to change its mind without very, very good reasons, okay? So not only, when you read a decision, you know, you shouldn't just be thinking, the court just decided an issue that affects me today, but really the court laid down a legal principle that's probably gonna stick around forever or for at least a very long time. You know, among the issues, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but among the issues the court decides, decides cases uh, about abortion access, uh, the death penalty, Recently, same-sex marriage, affirmative action, legislative districting, which is actually uh, less sexy than some of these other issues, but really deeply important. Uh, the, afford the issues about the Affordable Care Act, the validity of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, uh, unions, their ability to collect dues, uh, climate change regulations, like the coal, the coal plan that Obama has proposed, uh, immigration, so the court is going to rule on the validity of uh, Obama's immigration actions. Uh, these are all issues that come before the court, and they're issues on which the court often has final say. Uh, and I think uh, most, if not all, of these issues are actually before the court just this term, just this year. Okay, so it's it's a really big deal. It's a really important thing. Now let's talk a little bit about who they are and how they got there. The court typically has nine active justices. What this means is that Congress passed a law a long time ago saying there shall be nine Supreme Court justices. 
Now, as you probably know, right now we only have eight because Justice Scalia just died, and we haven't uh, confirmed his replacement yet. We also have three retired justices right now, uh, Justice O'Connor, Justice Souter, and Justice Stevens. Uh, they actually still hang around the court from time to time. They still hire law clerks, uh, and they still hear cases, not with the Supreme Court, but they actually will hear cases uh, with the courts of appeals. So uh, Justice Souter, for example, he lives in New Hampshire, and he will often sit as a judge on the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the circuit court uh, that uh, uh, takes appeals in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and some other New England states. Um, so they're not, uh, you know, they're retired but not yet gone. Mm -hmm. Now, the court hasn't always uh, had nine justices. Congress actually gets to decide. The Constitution, you saw the constitutional text. It doesn't specify how many justices should be on the court. Uh, at the outset, there were actually six, uh, and it's gone as high as ten. We have had even numbers of justices, uh, although the reason that we keep coming back to odd numbers is that even number doesn't tend to work too well in the long run. <laughs> uh, and we've been settled at nine since 1869, uh, although there was a brief period where it looked like we might get more uh, when Franklin Roosevelt wanted to... Oh, I just lost my microphones. Um, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to pack the court meaning raise the number of justices on the court and fill them with justices uh, that were favorable to his New Deal programs and New Deal legislation. But it didn't happen, and we still have none. Now, the judges, the Supreme Court says, both of the Supreme Court and inferior courts, and that means inferior federal courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior. This basically means they have life tenure. Right? It's not for a term of four years, it's not for a term of 20 years. They have life tenure unless they behave badly. Uh, and the standard for bad behavior is uh, pretty stringent. You have to behave pretty badly to be impeached uh, as a Supreme Court justice. Uh, and this is another reason that you know, this, this issue right now, the Garland nomination, and the upcoming election, it's a really big deal because whoever replaces Justice Scalia is likely going to be around for a really long time. Uh, Justice Stevens retired the year that I was working at the court at age 91. <coughs> he was there until he was 91 years old, uh, deciding cases. This is uh, actually the first Supreme Court. This is where the court met in 1790, and it's actually in New York City. It's uh, the Merchants Exchange Building in New York. Uh, it was only there briefly, and after that it moved to Philadelphia. Uh, and after some time in Philadelphia, uh, the court settled in for quite some time, about 70 years, uh, to this chamber, uh, which is actually inside of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, and you can go visit it. If you take a tour of the Capitol, you can go see the old Supreme Court. But over time, uh, you know, the, the justices started saying, you know, we're supposed to be a co-equal branch. We're supposed to be a check on what Congress is doing. How can we really be taken seriously and act as a check on this other branch when we basically are relegated to their basement? That's where this, this is. It's in the basement of the Capitol. So they said, we want our own building. Uh, and uh, Congress uh, appropriated money and built this beautiful building in 1935, which actually came in way under budget. You might be happy to know. Uh, the budget was quite large, but it came in under budget. Uh, and this is where the court has sat uh, since 1935. It's an absolutely gorgeous building. Uh, if you ever find yourself in DC and you haven't been to the Supreme Court, I recommend you go uh, and take a tour. It's very beautiful. Uh, this is the courtroom itself. It's, it's very majestic. Uh, your tour guide could tell you lots of interesting facts about how intentional the design was and how it was purposefully designed to make you know that you were going somewhere special and to give you the sense as you walk up these many steps and then you walk down this long marble corridor and you enter this courtroom that something important was happening here and something worthy of respect was happening here. Now how do they get there? This is what the Constitution says about how you get to be a judge on the Supreme Court. It says, the President shall nominate, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. You hear all this debate about Merrick Garland and whether the Senate is 
doing something appropriate or inappropriate. This is all the instruction we have. <coughs> different people are obviously reading this very differently from each other. But this is what the Constitution says about it. Notice there are no requirements or qualifications for service, right? It doesn't say anything about age, like the presidency does. It doesn't say anything about national origin, like the presidency does. And it doesn't specify anything about professional background, educational background. Now, as a matter of fact, it turns out that every nominee in our history has been a lawyer. Uh, not all of them have gone to law school, because law school is a relatively recent invention. It used to be that you could just apprentice for a lawyer or a judge, and then take the bar and become a member of the bar. Uh, there's actually one Supreme Court justice who never graduated high school, uh, but he uh, apprenticed and became a member of the bar and a very successful lawyer. Today, Almost all of the justices, uh, eight out of the nine if you count Scalia, or seven out of the eight if you don't, have served on a federal appellate court. So this is the one level below the Supreme Court. They've served there anywhere from one year of service to 20 years of service uh, before they are elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, I thought it would be worthwhile, given the statistics that I saw about uh, uh, how many Americans could name the different Supreme Court justices, to just kind of briefly run through the justices and give you a little bit of a sense of who they are, where they're from. Uh, and maybe that'll help you contextualize, you know, uh, where Justice Garland would fit in if he was ever confirmed, uh, or where the, the nominees of whoever the future president is uh, would fit in. So whenever you talk about the Supreme Court justices, you go in the order of seniority, except the Chief Justice is automatically the most senior. Uh, and order of seniority means uh, duration of tenure on the court, not uh, chronological age. So this is the Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts. He's the only Midwesterner on the court, actually. He grew up in Indiana. Uh, and before he became a judge, uh, he worked in various very fancy government jobs. He was uh, the uh, Principal Deputy Solicitor General, which basically meant uh, that he argued a lot of cases as a lawyer at the Supreme Court, and he was extremely well regarded for his skills as an advocate. Uh, he also worked in private practice for a while in a law firm, uh, and he, was, uh, he served as a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, one level below the Supreme Court, before uh, he was put onto the Supreme Court. Now, you might remember, if you followed this stuff, uh, he was actually first nominated to be an associate justice. Uh, an associate justice is the name, the title, for all of the justices other than the chief justice. So the regular justices are the associate justices. He was first nominated to be an associate justice to replace uh, Justice O'Connor when she retired. Uh, but then, uh, just 46 days later, Chief Justice Rehnquist passed away. And uh, Roberts had not been confirmed yet as an associate justice, and so uh, just two days after just Chief Justice Rehnquist died, uh, Bush uh, changed the nomination and nominated Roberts as the chief justice, uh, and he was confirmed by a pretty decent margin. He's also the youngest person to be confirmed as chief justice uh, since John Marshall was appointed back in 1801. So uh, he was very young uh, when he was appointed. Uh, he's now 61, but uh, still pretty young, right? Uh, this is Justice Kennedy. Uh, you hear his name a lot because, uh, at least until Justice Scalia passed away, he was often identified as the swing justice. He was the sort of the median justice politically, and that ended up giving him a lot of power uh, in cases because he'd often have four votes to his left and four votes to his right, and so whichever way he went would get the five votes. And, and get to decide the case. Uh, Justice Kennedy's from California. He was a law professor for s several decades, uh, I think uh, over 20 years uh, in California before he was put onto the Ninth Circuit by President Ford. Uh, his Supreme Court story is an interesting one. You may see that he was confirmed uh, 97 to 0, and you might think he was a, a really popular guy, an easy pick for the Supreme Court. But he wasn't. He was actually the third choice. So Kennedy got his seat uh, after Robert Bork uh, was nominated. Uh, and there was a very famous uh, confirmation hearings uh, at which uh, Bork was de ultimately defeated. Uh, Reagan then nominated uh, a very well-respected judge named Douglas Ginsburg, 
no relation to Ruth Ginsburg. Uh, but he, of course, uh, had to be withdrawn when it came out that he had smoked marijuana. Uh, <laughs> things have changed a lot. They really have. Uh, he, he, he would have been a Supreme Court justice today, I think. Uh, but at the time, it was seen as you know, uh, a deal breaker that he had smoked marijuana. Uh, and so uh, Ginsburg's nomination was withdrawn, and Kennedy was nominated as the last choice. Uh, also of interest uh, to current events, uh, Reagan ultimately nominated uh, Justice Kennedy during the final year of his presidency, and he was nominated and confirmed um, during that final year of Reagan's presidency. Although if people tell you only that, it's a little bit misleading because the confirmation battle had obviously been going on for some time when you count Bork and Ginsburg as well. This is Justice Thomas. Uh, he was a, a, a Bush one. Uh, nominee. Uh, he grew up in a very rural, very poor area of Georgia, uh, and he's the only justice with this kind of rural background. Uh, he actually grew up speaking a Creole dialect um, called Gullah, and uh, when he was nine years old, his family's house burned down, and he moved to Savannah, Georgia, and was ultimately raised by his grandfather. Uh, his biography is called My Grandfather's Son. It's actually very interesting if you haven't read it. Uh, after high school, he actually enrolled in the seminary uh, and planned to become a Catholic priest. Uh, but for reasons uh, I don't fully understand, he, he, he lost that path, ended up going to Holy Cross for college. Uh, and at that time, uh, he, he was actually a liberal activist. Uh, he's known today as one of the most conservative members of the court. Uh, but back then, he was uh, a Black Panther. He protested uh, against the Vietnam War uh, and campaigned for civil rights. Uh, he was also the chairman of the EEOC, the Equal Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, and then he was a judge on the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, same court as Chief Justice Roberts, uh, before he was ultimately nominated to the Supreme Court. You probably remember his nomination battle as well, uh, it's the one that involved Anita Hill and the accusations of sexual harassment, uh, and there's just been a TV show that just finished airing uh, called The Confirmation, which is all about it. I haven't watched it, but my colleagues at the law school tell me it's actually quite riveting. This is Justice Ginsburg. Uh, she's my justice. She's the justice I worked for uh, when I worked at the court. Uh, she is from a sort of working class uh, neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, ended up graduating first in her class at Cornell and first in her class at Columbia Law School. Uh, she was also the first female tenured professor at Columbia Law School. And she was an accomplished litigator uh, at the ACLU uh, she argued a number of very groundbreaking uh, women's rights cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, and she was also a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals before uh, she was put on the Supreme Court. She was easily confirmed, 96 to 3. And this one, I think, does uh, somewhat reflect the changing times, because I, I have to say it's pretty hard for me to imagine uh, an ACLU attorney uh, being confirmed 96 to 3 in the current political environment. <laughs> what do you think of that? I think it's, it's an improvement. It's, a, it's regression, but uh, it's hard for me to picture Justice Ginsburg being uh, uh, confirmed unanimously uh, today, or near unanimously. This is Justice Breyer, the one that no one's heard of. Only 3% of the American public uh, uh, have heard of him. Uh, he actually uh, was very close to getting the seat uh, prior, but Justice Ginsburg narrowly beat him out. Uh, uh, and. The story is that uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton thought he was going to nominate Breyer uh, and called him in for an interview and just really didn't like him. Uh, and he just liked Justice Ginsburg a lot more, so he nominated Ginsburg. But then when another vacancy came available, he said, all right, all right, and he gave it to Stephen Breyer, who was a very, very well-respected uh, Harvard Law professor, actually, and a judge on the First Circuit Court of Appeals, chief judge of the First Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, you might be interested to know, uh, he grew up in California, and his mother uh, was a volunteer for the League of Women Voters. Uh, and that same mother uh, insisted that he go to college at Stanford uh, rather than Harvard so that he wouldn't become too bookish. Uh, if you've ever been around him or heard him speak, you would see that that was a massive failure. <laughs> He's just about the most bookish person you could ever imagine. Uh, this is Justice Alito. Uh, he's one of George W. Bush's nominees. Uh, he was a longtime federal prosecutor 
He was appointed to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which uh, has New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, a few other states in that region. Uh, and he was a respected Third Circuit judge uh, before he was nominated to the Supreme Court uh, by Bush. Uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton both voted against uh, his confirmation, uh, and actually both voted uh, in favor of a filibuster uh, of his nomination. You see, he won by a, a, a fairly small margin. Uh, Thomas, I think, is the closest vote of the sitting justices, 52 to 48. Uh, but Alito's was pretty close as well. This is uh, one of Obama's two justices, uh, Sonia Sotomayor. She's the first uh, Latina justice, uh, let, uh, I say Latina, but she's the first uh, justice, male or female, uh, of Hispanic origin. Uh, she was a, a prosecutor for a long time in New York, uh, also in private practice, and was actually uh, first nominated to be a judge by George H.W. Bush uh, to the federal trial court. She was then elevated to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the appellate circuit in New York, uh, and then eventually to the Supreme Court. And this is our last justice, uh, Elena Kagan. Um, she is the only one of the sitting justices who was not a judge before she became a Supreme Court justice. Uh, she was actually dean of Harvard Law School when I attended Harvard. Uh, and was a very popular professor there. And she was the Solicitor General of the United States, which is uh, kind of the country's most important lawyer, the lawyer who represents the United States in the Supreme Court. Uh, and so she was a, a, an incredibly well-respected attorney. Uh, but she is the first to join the court since 1972 uh, with no prior judicial experience. Now, I think I'd be remiss. I, I understand this is not supposed to be a, a political event, and I don't plan to make it political. But I think everyone knows that certain justices tend to vote together, and certain justices tend not to vote together. Uh, and there are political scientists who spend a lot of time on this topic and trying to figure out uh, the ideologies of the different justices and compare them and uh, put them on a scale. Uh, and so this is one uh, uh, popular uh, ideology for rating judges. And when you plot the justices, this is what you get. Now this is, I think you can figure out how the scale works. Uh, the zero would be completely, completely politically moderate. Uh, and if you're in the negatives, that means you are considered a, a liberal. If you are a uh, positive number, you are considered a conservative. Uh, if you're interested, I could go into the methodologies, but I will tell you that different political scientists use completely different methodologies to, to get at this question, and the answers are very, very consistent. Uh, different methodologies produce very, very similar uh, ideology readings. And so this is what the court looked like. And what's important, remember, this is a nine-justice court. You need five votes to win. So we used to have five votes firmly to the right of center. I said earlier uh, that Kennedy was considered, in popular culture, to be the swing justice. You'll actually see, according to this rating, uh, Roberts is the, is the median justice. They're very close to each other. But what this means is that there are going to be a lot of cases where uh, the four in blue are going to vote one way. Uh, Thomas, Alito, and Scalia, and usually either Roberts or Kennedy would vote another way, and then the other of Roberts or Kennedy would be in the middle. But when people try to tell you that the court is just politics, that they're just politicians in robes, this kind of stuff, in my opinion, it's a gross exaggeration. I don't know if you can see this. I know the numbers are a little small. But what this is is a chart showing how frequently the different justices vote with each other, agree with each other. And the thing to know is even if you pick two justices who you think of as being very opposed politically, let's say the bottom row is Clarence Thomas. Let's say you look at Thomas and Sotomayor. There's a 71 in that box. That means that Justice Thomas and Justice Sotomayor vote together 71% of the time, which actually strikes me as a fairly high number, especially if all you digest is you know, the news article saying how they're basically just politicians. Uh, and as you get to the middle and you see, let's say, Kennedy and Breyer, they vote together 81% of the time. Uh, now you see, let's see, Ginsburg and Kagan are voting together 93% of the time. So it's considerably more. But again, 
you know, Thomas and Sotomayor are voting together 71% of the time, which is a, a, a clear majority of the time. Here's another interesting thing uh, about voting patterns. Um, so this shows uh, the Roberts court versus all prior courts. And you see something interesting. At the top is 9-0 decisions, so unanimous decisions. Now, when Roberts was nominated to be the Chief Justice, he talked a lot about wanting to achieve consensus on the court and wanting there to be more agreement and more unanimity on the court. By this measure, and by other measures, uh, uh, using similar calculations, he has accomplished that in a sense. The number of, uh, the proportion of 9-0 decisions has gone up during the Roberts court relative to past courts. But, if you looked ahead to the next line, the next line shows 5-4 decisions. So these are the narrowly divided decisions, the close calls. Those have also gone up under the Roberts Court. And I think this is a really interesting thing about the court that's, that's often overlooked. So I thought a lot today uh, while driving here about you know, what, to say, what to say about this. What does this mean? I think ultimately what it means is that you know, the court is sort of both more and less political than people <coughs> often give it credit for. Uh, you know, many cases are 9-0, and I think if you're thinking about one of these cases, it seems like the ideology of the justices shouldn't and doesn't matter very much, except for maybe a justice whose ideology was just way out of the mainstream and, and caused him or her to, to part ways with the other eight, right? In these cases, you know, if I'm thinking about what kind of justice do I want, I just want competent, smart, justice, maybe a good writer so that the opinions are readable for the public. But ideology, you know, plays very little part in this 31% of cases that are 9-0. But then, of course, you have the 23% of cases that are 5-4 decisions. These are the hard cases, okay? These are the cases in which I would say the law doesn't fully answer the question, or uh, to use a phrase that legal academics sometimes use, the law runs out, okay? Remember, nearly all of the cases that the U.S. Supreme Court decides are cases on which lower courts have disagreed. So in a sense, it's actually quite remarkable that there are so many 9 0 decisions. You wonder what those lower court judges were disagreeing about if you could get, you know, Justice Thomas and, and Justice Sotomayor to agree in so many cases, right? But even think about a case like no vehicles in the park, right? That's what the law says, no vehicles in the park. These justices have to decide our bicycle case. And that's all the law they have, okay? The law runs out. It doesn't answer the question. Now, you might think, oh, I got an easy solution. Just look it up in the dictionary and do whatever the dictionary says. It's not going to work so well. Which dictionary are you going to use, okay? I can find a different dictionary from you. It's going to have very different definitions of what a vehicle is from your dictionary. There's also going to be multiple definitions of dictionary of, uh, of a vehicle in each dictionary, okay? Or think of more realistic cases. So think of a, a famous case. Do separate but equal schools deprive students of the equal protection of the laws? That is all of the legal text you have to go on. Equal protection of the laws. Do separate but equal schools deprive students of equal protection of the laws even if you knew that the Congress that enacted that language had segregated seating areas, right? We think that Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 was an easy case. It wasn't an easy case. The very Congress that, that put into law those words, no state shall deprive an individual of equal protection of the laws, they had racially segregated seating, okay? Or does an affirmative action program deprive applicants of equal protection of the laws? Or does it actually effectuate the purposes of that very same guarantee? Or think about the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects your right to free speech, okay? Is dance a form of speech? Is painting a form of speech? Is commercial advertising a form of speech? Is pornography a form of speech? Is spending money a form of speech? What if you're spending it to donate to political campaigns? Is that a form of speech? All the Constitution says is free speech. The law runs out very quickly, okay? Does it deprive a criminal defendant of his right to counsel if his lawyer falls asleep during his trial? 
Or is it enough that there was a warm body sitting there next to him? These are, these are real cases, by the way. You know, in all of these cases, the court has to look outside of the applicable text. And so you have this question, what should it look to? Okay? A lot of people say history. History can help, but it's often very indeterminate. Right? You have your favorite historical source, I have mine. You're a Hamilton guy, I like Madison. Right? They have different opinions. Okay? It often doesn't help. And in the end, because this is a court that has to decide concrete cases, there's just no avoiding judgment. Right? Either the sleeping lawyer violates the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, or he doesn't. The court has to decide. So I want to reappropriate uh, a metaphor that Chief Justice Roberts famously used uh, during his confirmation process. He says the role of the judge, you know, we don't make law, we're not activists, we just sit there and call balls and strikes, okay? I think this is actually a uniquely, a uniquely inapt metaphor, okay? <laughs> Any baseball fan knows that every umpire has a different strike zone. Right? Some umpires have big strike zones, and some umpires have small strike zones. Now, for pitches that go right down the middle, it doesn't matter. Right? Every umpire is going to call that a strike. Okay? But for the pitches that are a little high or a little low, then which umpire you get can matter immensely. It can change a strike to a ball, or vice versa. It's the same thing in law. Right? Everyone agrees what the question in my sleepy lawyer case is. The question is, does this sleepy lawyer deprive the defendant of his right to counsel? But some judges, acting in good faith, will see the case as, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's just on the permissible side of the line. You know, after all, the lawyer seemed to otherwise be doing a pretty good job through most of the trial. It was a long trial. The fact that he fell asleep for 10 minutes, you know, we're not going to redo the whole trial. That's actually closer to what the law is. Uh, uh, but other judges, also acting in good faith, are going to just see this as too much to tolerate. We need to do this trial over. That's a constitutional violation, right? And the exercise of that kind of judgment, you know, what, how much sleeping at trial goes too far? <laughs> It's necessarily going to be informed by the judge's personal philosophy and the judge's vision of how American democracy works, right? And I think that, in turn, is inevitably going to be shaped by the judge's background and life experiences. Now, I'm almost done talking, and I'm, I'm interested to take your questions, but I, I thought you might find this interesting. So, remember this chart I showed you, this one? You might be wondering, so where does Merrick Garland fit in, right? So one of my colleagues, uh, who actually wrote this paper, uh, he applied the same ideology to Garland, and this is where Garland ends up. I think there's a, a few things you can see from this. One is that you know, the, claim, the president's claim that Garland is a pretty moderate guy seems to be borne out, right? He's closer to the zero than anyone up there. Now, is he to the left of the zero? Absolutely. You probably would expect that, since Barack Obama's a Democrat, right? But he is close to the zero. But it's also true that it's a major change, right? So if you block out Scalia, because he's gone, who is the new median justice? The new median justice would be Garland, right? And so you're shifting the, 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 the fulcrum of power in the court from Roberts or Kennedy over to Garland, which, of course, depending on your political leanings, is either wonderful or horrible. Right? So it's, it's simultaneously true that Garland is a pretty moderate guy. Uh, it's definitely true that he's a universally well-respected judge. Uh, but it's also true that it's going to affect a major change within the court. And I think this is my last slide. Let me just show you one, one uh, uh, practical effect that we've already seen from Scalia's vacancy. Uh, there was a, a very big case in the court this year uh, called Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. And in this case, uh, this is a case about teachers' unions. And the lower court upheld what are called agency fees for non-union members. The idea here is that teachers who don't want to join the union are still forced to contribute what are called agency fees because, the union says, we're still representing those teachers' interests when we bargain with management, 
Okay? So they still have to contribute. Now, some people, uh, the people who brought this lawsuit, think that this violates the, the First Amendment because it's forcing these teachers who don't want to be in the union to pay money to support the union's speech. Okay? The Supreme Court was widely expected to reverse the lower court, meaning to strike down this agency fee arrangement and hold that public sector unions like teacher unions could not require teachers who did not want to join the union to contribute agency fees. Everyone predicted it was 5-4. But when Justice Scalia died, the vote became 4-4. Okay? Because it was going to be the five conservative justices who were going to vote to reverse. The vote became 4-4. And what that means is it turns from a reversal into an affirmance of the lower court's decision, therefore upholding the agency fees. And so the outcome completely flips. And I think if you, most people expect if, if you plugged in Garland, it would have become 5-4 in the other direction. So it does really make a difference. All right, I, I have a lot more I can say, but I'm going to stop there uh, and take your questions. Uh, I, I hope it was clear from my comments. I'm not here to try to persuade you of any particular viewpoint. Uh, that's not my objective. I'm here to try to answer questions that you might have about the court and how it works. Sometimes that requires being frank about politics that are just present in the court's operations, uh, but, but I'm not looking to have you know, any ideological fight here. So with that said, uh, do I just call on people? Is that how this works? Uh, John? Um, oh yeah, you're free to leave. I won't be offended. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, my, my question is, uh, isn't it possible that uh, a nominee will uh, change uh, a political strife? Uh, yes. So the question is whether nominees sometimes change once they're on the bench, right? Yes. Uh, the, the, the historical evidence suggests sometimes definitely yes, uh, but relatively infrequently. And I think most people would expect it will happen less and less. Uh, so it used to be uh, that presidents would occasionally nominate uh, very prestigious judges who were very well respected. They almost always nominated judges from their own political party, but not 100% of the time. Uh, and they didn't often do a lot of homework. Uh, and so you have very famous cases, uh, Earl Warren, William Brennan, John Paul Stevens. Uh, these are all justices who are seen as liberal uh, leaders on the court. They were nominated by Republican presidents. Uh, uh, Justice Souter was nominated by a Republican, uh, and they all shifted to the left. Justice White was uh, seen as someone who maybe shifted rightward. Uh, but the re part of the reason that these confirmation battles seem to be coming more and more uh, high stakes and more and more involved is that uh, people on both sides are investing more and more in making sure they understand who they have. Uh, if you read a story about Justice Souter's nomination, for example, it's clear that President Bush really didn't know very much about him. Uh, he was this kind of reclusive guy from New Hampshire, uh, really smart, lives in a house full of books, uh, and he was a Republican. You know, he voted Republican, and that was good enough. Today, that wouldn't be good enough. So, certainly possible, but I think you're going to see it less and less. Yes? I'm interested in the, in the clerks. Uh, yeah. Do, uh, are there rules that uh, assign the number of clerks, uh, or does it vary all the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and the, uh, the dynamics yeah. among the, the clerks. Question. Okay, so the question is about law clerks. Are there rules that assign the number of clerks, or assign uh, who gets which clerks? And uh, also you said the, the dynamics among the clerks? Yeah, okay, so, so the answer is that uh, each justice has four clerks each year. Uh, I think without exception today, uh, the law clerks are uh, recent law school graduates who have already clerked on a circuit court of appeals. So I clerked on the Ninth Circuit, so other people clerk on different circuits. Uh, and the justices uh, get tons and tons of applications and they hire uh, four, four law clerks. Uh, they, many of the justices tend to hire people uh, at least whose resumes make it appear that they have the same political leanings. Uh, not always. 
Uh, Justice Scalia used to famously hire uh, one liberal clerk each term, three conservative clerks, one liberal clerk. That practice actually uh, waned at some point, and by the time I was there, he had four very conservative clerks. Uh, but, you know, different, some justices don't look at it very much, others focus on that quite a bit. But each one gets four clerks, and the clerks interact a lot. Uh, the justices actually don't interact face-to-face -face very much. When they go to conference, I showed you that picture of the conference room, that's the first time that they have talked to each other about the case. The law clerks have been talking about it for months, and they often act as go-betweens. Um, so sometimes Justice Ginsburg would say, you know, will you see if you can figure out, you know, what Justice Kennedy is thinking about this case? And then I would go see Justice Kennedy's law clerk and ask, and, you know, sometimes they felt comfortable sharing, sometimes they didn't, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of personal politics that goes along with that. But the clerks uh, 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 are very interactive. Uh, you know, there are some books out there with these stories of sort of runaway law clerks, you know, law clerks are exercising the power. I didn't see that when I was there, um, but, but those stories are out there. They may be apocryphal. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Yes, uh, gentlemen in the back. Yeah, you talked about uh, judges being elevated to the uh, uh, appeals court. <laughs> That's not an automatic thing. They have to go through a reconfirmation. That's right. Yeah, so the question was, uh, when judges are elevated from one court to another, do they have to be uh, uh, confirmed again? The answer is yes, but it's definitely seen as a much easier road. Uh, for someone like Justice Sotomayor, I think it was seen as an especially easy road uh, because she had been nominated by a Republican president to begin with and then was being elevated to the Second Circuit uh, by uh, a Democrat president. When she was nominated to the Supreme Court, it was a, you know, there was a real fight. Uh, but um, yeah, you have to go through the whole process again. But you filled out a lot of the paperwork and things like that, and you've been filing financial disclosures, and some of the, the legwork that nominees have to do, you've been doing it all along. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah. When, uh, when they're going through that second process, are they in jeopardy of losing their old job? Or if they didn't get confirmed going up, would they keep the old job? Uh, so the question is, if, if they're being elevated and they're not confirmed to the elevated appointment, do they lose their old job? Uh, I've never heard of anyone losing their old job, and I, I don't believe that they would lose their old job. But I come to think of it, I mean, I can't say I've like seen the law that answers this question, but I've never heard of anyone uh, losing the old job by, by going up for a, a higher appointment. Yeah, thank you. Well, they, they are uh, judges for life. If they're federal judges, they're, they're judges for life. If they are considered for something else, they're still federal, whatever they were, federal district or federal court of appeals judges. They have, unless they do something wrong, yes. their misbehavior and uh, or they're impeached or they resign. Right. So, the, so the, the gentleman points out that you know, they, as I said, the judges have life tenure, and so why would you give up your life tenure if you're uh, going up for an elevated appointment? That seems right to me, uh, but I know that judges sometimes. Um, quit doing all work. So Merrick Garland, for example, uh, has uh, pulled off all his cases. He's doing absolutely no work uh, on the D.C. Court of Appeals right now while he's under consideration for the Supreme Court. So I can imagine a judge that decides to actually resign the post and, and, and sort of roll the dice, but I don't think that's common. Yes, but they have to resign. Yes, yes, they would have to resign to lose it. Yes, that's right. Other questions? Uh, yes, in the back. When you were talking about the decision that they have to have four votes in order to hear a case. Yeah. What other uh, criteria or what other things are they looking at? Um, if they, you know, what, what makes them decide the importance of yes or no? Yeah, so, I mean, the main thing is this, uh, the idea of circuit splits, where I showed you this map uh, that's coming up, where they're looking for uh, legal issues that have divided the courts of appeals, and so there's this need to bring uh, uniformity uh, to the country on, on the interpretation of federal law. Um, but there's no denying that they also look for just questions of great importance. Um, that can mean different things. Uh, death penalty cases have a greater likelihood of getting review than other criminal cases uh, because someone's life is on the line, even if the particular question in that death penalty case is not necessarily one that will affect a huge number of people. 
Um, so that's one thing. Or things like, you know, the validity of Obamacare. The, the court is not blind to the fact that this is a, a major federal statute that's going to affect uh, the vast majority of Americans in the country and determine, you know, whether people have health insurance, how much it costs, how they get it. And so they know that there's some benefit to uh, quickly resolving the validity of an important federal law like that. Um, so they look at things like, uh, 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 yeah, the, the disagreements and then the importance of the issue. Um, sometimes they'll also look at things like, uh, how long have the lower courts been thinking about an issue? So for example, if the no vehicles in the park case comes out and Seven Circuit says, Yes, Sixth Circuit says no, and then someone tries to get the court to hear the case. The Supreme Court might say, no, we're going to wait. There's a lot of other circuits out there, and we're going to see what the other circuits do um, for several reasons. One is we may be uh, beneficially uh, informed by the diversity of opinions and, and the rationales, but another is just that uh, maybe every other circuit will side with the seventh, and then the sixth will actually realize, eh, we should just change our mind. And then there would be no need for the Supreme Court to review the case. So sometimes you get considerations like this as well. Yes? Uh, you talked about precedents being set and then held for a while. Um, I'm thinking about Citizens United. Yeah. I'm wondering if you, if you think there's any likelihood of that being looked at again once the, the ninth is appointed. I, I, Oh, so the question was uh, whether Citizens United might be reconsidered uh, when the, the Ninth Justice is confirmed, uh, especially, presumably, if, if it's a Democrat appointee who would be more inclined, uh, all else equal, to want to reconsider Citizens United. Um, I'm skeptical. I know you hear about this a lot. I, I'm skeptical. I think uh, it's a very recent precedent. The court has also entrenched it to some extent by deciding several cases in reliance on Citizens United. I think more likely, uh, would be that the new five justice uh, uh, liberal majority would find ways to hem it in. Uh, often there's you know there's a lot of strategy that goes on, and I think uh, one way to undermine Citizens United is just to overrule it outright. I'm skeptical that they do that. Another way to undermine it is to limit it and say, well, it doesn't apply in this kind of case, and it doesn't apply in that kind of case, and it has this limitation, and you sort of end up, they call it death by a thousand paper cuts sometimes. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. cut away at it uh, you know, from a lot of different angles. That would be my prediction of, of how things would go, um, rather than an outright overruling. Yeah. Uh, in the far back corner? Yes. Well, do you think they'll hold in abeyance any of these really important uh, cases coming up because there are just eight justices? Yeah. In other words, wait until that ninth justice comes in? Yeah, I wrote some, I wrote some notes down about this, actually. Uh, so the question is whether the court would hold in abeyance any uh, important cases while they wait for a ninth justice so that they don't have ties. Um, there's some sign that they may do this a little bit. So. Uh, they have already delayed five cases until next term uh, that would ordinarily have been scheduled for argument this spring, and they, they put them off to next year's calendar. Now, that doesn't necessarily appear to be like the five most important cases. It was more, uh, I think it was closer to being the last five cases that they granted that in an ordinary year would have been calendared for this spring. They, they pushed off. Um, they're, they did something unusual in the, um, there's an a Affordable Care Act case about the contraceptive mandate, and they took this really unusual step of asking for additional briefing, where it almost seems like they're trying to work out uh, a, a compromise of some sort, or they're trying to encourage the parties to work out a compromise. This is something that lower courts do all the time. Uh, trial court judges will just frankly tell the parties, you guys should settle this case, work something out. But it's very unusual for the Supreme Court to do it. Um, and so that's some sign of you know, reacting to the 4-4 to the four -four divide. Um, so I, you know, as beyond that, I'd be totally speculating you know, whether they might uh, set a few cases for re-argument next, next term. They might, uh, especially if it would leave uh, the lower courts in, in, in disarray, then they might. Uh, I guess I would predict there would probably be a handful of those, um, but it's really hard to say which ones. 
Yeah. Uh, gentleman right here had a question. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a process question more than anything else. Uh, when, the, uh, when there's like a high pro profile case, oftentimes the court gets inundated with amicus briefs. And my question is, is that something that the law clerks take on as a responsibility or the judges? And kind of as a follow-up question, does any of that reasoning turn up in decisions? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is about amicus briefs. An amicus brief is called a, a friend of the court brief. It's a brief that is filed by someone other than the actual parties to the litigation. So it's, a, it's an interested party usually. So in, let's say, a major criminal case, uh, and the, case, the litigation is between the defendant and the government. And then you'll get these organizations like the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers will file an amicus brief, and you'll get many, many organizations. So Citizens United had, I think, 64 amicus briefs, which is an outrageous number. I mean, it takes up a whole bookshelf. Uh, and the question was, uh, do the justices look at these? Do they pass it off to the law clerks? Do the amicus briefs actually affect the decisions? Uh, I may be jaded on this. I, I think they're largely pointless. Um, they make money for the lawyers who write them often. Uh, so I guess there's that, that, that might be a point uh, if you're a lawyer. Um, I think there are very few justices who have the time to read 64 amicus briefs. Uh, my boss, Justice Ginsburg, did ask me to read all 64 amicus briefs. <laughs> and identify, she asked me to identify the two or three on each side that I thought were most informative, uh, which I tried to do. Um, some justices did not even make their law clerks look at them. Uh, in those chambers, I think the law clerks might thumb through and look for amicus briefs by, you know, really prominent, respected organizations or prominent, respected lawyers and maybe thumb through those. Uh, as to whether the reasoning ever makes its way into the decisions, you know, never say never. Occasionally it does. Occasionally. Especially if the, uh, the lawyers for the actual litigants are poor, which they're usually not. They're usually very good lawyers. But occasionally, uh, some uh, uh, you know, not very talented lawyer gets lucky and gets the case up in the Supreme Court, and writes a, a, a weak brief, and then the amicus briefs might actually uh, uh, end up you know, influencing the decision. But it's really the exception. Of and I think that's most of the justices' views, too, is that they're, it's, a, it's a bit much, all the, all the amicus briefs. Yeah. Yes? Has a justice ever been removed from the court because of bad behavior? Uh, not exactly, but close to. So the question was, has a justice ever been removed for bad behavior? It got pretty close. Um, justice Fortas uh, resigned. Uh, there were some uh, questionable financial transactions. Uh, and he may have eventually been removed had he not resigned. Um, and I think that Samuel Chase, a long, long time ago, was impeached but never convicted and not ultimately removed. Um, so no, I don't think anyone's ever actually been removed for bad behavior. Who would, who would have uh, instituted the impeachment proceedings? That's a good question. I'm guessing it's the Senate, but... Uh, I'm guessing it's the Senate, yeah. but it happens so rarely that I'm not sure. Yeah. House, House impeaches, yeah. House Senate impeaches. tries the case, okay. yeah. Chief yeah. Justice yeah. is the presiding officer. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the support. <laughs> yes. I'm wondering, is there any mechanism that would encourage the Senate to consider an appointee? And apparently it seems they're going to wait until after the election. What if uh, we continue to have a... Uh, Republican Senate, and we have a Democratic president. Does this go on? I, uh, I asked that question at dinner. Um, I had dinner with a few members of the, of the organization, and I asked that question. Uh, the question is, you know, is there any way to actually force the Senate to consider a nominee? Um, if we have a Republican Senate and a, and a Democrat president, could this go on indefinitely? I think the answer is uh, just politics. It's got to be, the, the polity has to get upset enough about it. Uh, for the senators to feel that their jobs might be in danger uh, if they don't go forward, but nothing I can think of other than that. There's clearly this, the uh, court can't really do its job. Yeah, well, you know, know, I told you they had six justices at one time, they had ten justices at one time. I mean, I, I'm saying that somewhat facetiously, I agree with you in general, 
Uh, looks like I have input here again. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> politics plays a part in uh, over the, the long haul, the 200 years history, in just that sort of thing. Uh, in 19, I have a little personal experience on this. Okay. In 1992, uh, there were 67 nominees by President, first President Bush, for various courts, appellate and otherwise around the country, who never got hearings. Mm -hmm. Though they sat there for a year or more, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, I did some tracking on the history, and the average consideration prior to them for a court of appeals judge was two months, and that didn't happen in that year, and uh, Vice President Biden now was Senator Biden who held us all, us, me also, up. So uh, I remember it vividly. <laughs> yeah. By the way, one of those other people was a guy from the uh, D.C. Circuit. And I asked him one night, I said, what, what do we get out of this? You know, we're not going to get confirmed. And he said, we get a lot. And I said, what? And he said, we get the right to use initials after our name. <laughs> really? What initials? A-J-O. A-J-O? Like PhD? Yeah. Almost judge once. <laughs> <laughs> that judge is a guy by the name of John Roberts. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, look, I, I think uh, you read in the newspapers about the Garland nomination. Uh, there are claims about whether it's unprecedented or not, what's happening. I think it depends on, on how you find it. Is it unprecedented? I mean, maybe the idea of not the Judiciary Committee not scheduling the hearing might be unprecedented, but th there were decades and decades of nominations where the Judiciary Committee was not even involved. So the, the idea of precedent for this is a little sketchy. I did write up some examples. So, uh, you know, this is not the first time that the Senate has been uh, uh, pushing back on the president. Andrew Johnson actually made a nomination, uh, and the Senate didn't take action on the nomination, and they wanted so badly to deny Johnson the ability to put justices on the court that they actually reduced the size of the court. And so uh, each time a justice would uh, die or retire, the court just got smaller and smaller. Uh, and then, when the Republicans captured the White House, they increased the court back up to eight, and their, their president got to put someone on the court. Uh, the longest vacancy is two years, four months. Um, so this kind of thing, you know, has happened before. You know, but then I say, but, but, but not always. I mean, 19 justices have been confirmed during an election year. Uh, and, and a really interesting one, if you go way back, uh, John Marshall was uh, nominated by Adams after Adams uh, uh, had lost the election uh, to his bitter rival, Jefferson. He's after that, he nominated Marshall, and Marshall was confirmed. And Marshall became the most important chief justice the country's ever had. So, you know, you can find anecdotes on both sides. Uh, you can find precedent if you want to think, you know, what happened to Andrew Johnson is precedent, and you can find precedent for, for confirmation, certainly, uh, if, you, if that's what you want to find. Yeah, other questions? Yes. Um, the question about reducing the size of the court from 10 to 7, mm -hmm. did the president have to sign that into law? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Repeat it. So the question was, if, if Congress had wanted to uh, reduce the size of the court from 10 to 7, wouldn't the president have had to uh, sign the bill into law uh, I mean, they might have been able to override a veto. Uh, okay, so they probably would have overridden him. I thought maybe he could veto the bill. Yeah, but Congress can override a veto if they have enough votes. Right. Okay. Uh, I know the facts are accurate. I don't know uh, this, the answer to that question. My guess would, from, from context, would have to be that they overrode the veto, but I don't know. Do you know the answer to that one? I don't know whether they were that, wrote that veto or not. I yeah. don't know the answer. Well, to put this in historical context, Andrew Johnson was, was impeached. Was what? Impeached. Was impeached. Yes. Yes. And it's not as if he had a great relationship with the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> the following year, I think he was, he was impeached. He, yes. wasn't, he wasn't thrown out because there was one vote. Senator Ross from Kansas who, instead of voting with the radical Republicans, voted not to, not to impeach him. I, I think um, 
and, and uh, this is not my view in particular, but I, I don't know that Obama has the best relationship with the Senate either. Uh, maybe it's not at the level of Andrew Johnson, but uh, you know, I've heard people say the same thing. I'll say that. Uh, any other questions, or are we out of time? One more. One more? Anybody? No. All right. Well, thank, thank you for having you. me.